subscribe to my Patreon to support this channel, patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. It's how you sustain this work right here, as well as my columns and everything else that I do. Okay, so let's get to it, guys. It's Asada Shakur's birthday. Now, Asada Shakur has been a very uh, influential person, force, uh, in my politics, my political life, especially early on, but you know, that endures into today. And so her autobiography is incredible. You should read it. She's now 75 years old. So happy 75th to Asada Shakur. Asada Shakur has gained more prominence in recent years because of the Black Lives Matter movement. You see her quoted, we have nothing to lose but our chains. Um, we have a duty to fight, all of that. There's a whole slogan that was made out of her autobiography that Black Lives Matter activists or people under the umbrella of Black Lives Matter chanted. So Asada Shakur has gained more prominence. Her autobiography has become more popular, and that's a really good thing. Now, I do think that she's been sanitized a bit, that only certain pieces of her are talked about. But I'm going to pull up a piece that I wrote in 2019 about her um, creative experiences, I said, no, not Tupac's mom, Tupac's aunt. Uh, Afini Shakur was Tupac's mother. And I believe that was Asada Shakur's sister. So Asada Shakur, yes, she does have a relationship to Tupac Shakur. Um, so Afini and Asada were both in the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Movement more so. So uh, uh, primarily Asada Shakur was in the Black Liberation Movement. She was arrested and imprisoned. I believe in 1977 and spent two years in prison, actually gave birth in prison, I believe. And then she escaped. Um, she escaped prison after the famous shootout with, uh, I believe it was Sundiata Coley. And oh, man, he was just released from prison. Can't remember the other person um, who was involved in that shootout with the New Jersey police, uh, New Jersey state troopers. Uh, but it's all in the autobiography. You should read it. But nonetheless, she escaped from prison in 1979. And then finally, after five years of hiding and running, she was given asylum, political asylum in Cuba. And she's been living there ever since. So Sada Shakur is a revolutionary. She's a socialist, black liberation leader, someone who's very influential and should be appreciated for all that she has contributed because she has contributed a lot, even just through her autobiography. But that's just the half of it. I mean, the legacy that she leaves and that she's left us is one that uh, we should all be able to get behind, right? Because th this is just a concrete figure, someone who is all about the collective liberation movement, all about uh, defending the ideology of the Black Liberation Army and the Black Panther Party, socialism, the struggle against colonialism, and... Uh, uh, you know, she turned 75 today and we should appreciate her. So I want to, um, I want to read an article that I wrote in 2019 in June. So about three years ago, just to, um, give you a sense of sort of what I, what I've spoken uh, about, uh, what I, how I've talked about Asada Shakur. And so, as you should all know, you know, the work, when you support me, like on Patreon and whatnot, most of my years, I've been writing since, you know, I wasn't really a streamer until recently, last couple of years, but I was a right, I've been writing since 2013, 14. And most of that, if not 99, 90% of it, 90 to 95% pro bono. So, you know, I... You know, supporting me is, is is not just supporting the work that I've done, but also the the work that I'm doing now, but the work that I've done. So it's not a Shakur in the long war on black liberation, right? I wrote this in 2019, and what was what's happened to Asada Shakur that you should all know is that the reactionary damn fascist, he's a fascist, Bob Menendez, senator of New Jersey, he has waged a campaign, a, a war. A, a, a campaign to capture Asada Shakur with the FBI. And so initially, there was a $1 million, I mean, $1 million on Asada Shakur's head. 
that was increased by Bob Menendez. Uh, I believe uh, that was done uh, during the Obama administration. So I'm going to read this article just to get a sense of how I've talked about Asad Shakur. And, uh, you know, I think he gives a good background of a lot of things, a good summary. So during the height of the Black Lives Matter movement, Asad Shakur's name saw increased recognition. A section of our autobiography was used as a slogan in demonstrations against racist policing throughout the country. Quote, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. This statement, while powerful, was unable to ignite a broad conversation in the Black Lives Matter movement or U.S. society in general on the plight and condition of Asada Shakur. As executive editor of Black and late uh, Black Agenda Report, executive editor Glenn Ford noted, the quote-unquote soft power of U.S. imperialism in the form of corporate philanthropy has played a significant role in watering down the politics of what is now a much quieter movement than what existed in the twilight years of the Obama era. This was before the 2020 uprisings. This was like one year before the uprisings in 2020. So at this time, the, the Black Lives Matter uprisings had basically dissipated. And we're kind of in that moment again. Yet Asada Shakur's current situation is a reminder that the U.S.'s long war on the Black liberation movement is far from over. Senate Democrat Bob Menendez and Senate Republican Marco Rubio have introduced a resolution in the Senate that demands for the immediate extradition of Asada Shakur from Cuba. The resolution comes as U.S. aggression toward Cuba has escalated in the form of tighter sanctions and travel restrictions. There is no better time for the lynch mob in the U.S. imperial state to intensify their hunt of Assad Shakur. The Democratic Party is seeking to regain the Oval Office from the Republicans in the 2020 election. Furthermore, U.S. imperialism has failed in its attempt to overthrow the socialist government in Venezuela. Gusano Cuba voters in the U.S. know that the fate of Venezuela is intimately tied to Cuba's and their and base their electoral decisions on which candidate is most hostile toward the Cuba-Venezuela alliance. So, of course, Assad Shakur is not merely a domino of the U.S.'s war against Cuba and Venezuela, because that's what really was happening here. That resolution was all about a dog whistle to the voters in Florida, to the voters of that region of the country, who are all Cuban exiles, reactionaries, basically CIA attaches. And when they hear Asada Shakur, they think traitor. They think, I mean, they're racist. So they also think like black traitor, like someone who is a traitor to the United States and also in a trade, a country that they desperately want to see overthrown, a socialist country they definitely desperately want to see overthrown. So of course, um, she is a black revolutionary whose escape from prison in 1975 has forever been an embarrassment to the U.S. ruling class. Asada has lived in Cuba under legal asylum since 1984, and since then, the U.S. has failed to bully Cuba into releasing her into the hands of the U.S. national security state. Cuba has made it clear that its loyalty resides with the dictates of international law, not U.S. imperialism. While few in the U.S. recognize the existence of political prisoners in the United States, Socialist Cuba has provided safety for Asada Shakur, in part because the Cuban people have firsthand knowledge that only torture, abuse, and death awaits her in the United States. Rarely in the toxic political environment of the U.S. is the question asked, why is Asada Shakur so despised by the U.S. state? The ruling class describes Shakur as a quote-unquote cop killer who needs to be brought to justice. What lies beneath the accusation is the U.S. imperialist war against the Black Liberation Movement. Dozens upon dozens of former members of the Black Panther Party have been accused of murdering police officers with little to no evidence and assigned to permanent incarceration. This includes Mamiya Abu-Jamal, Sundiata Kohli, who was with Asada Shakur on the day of the shootout on the New Jersey Turnpike, and Russell Maroon Schultz. Unfortunately, since the time of this rioting, Russell Maroon Schultz has died, and Sundiata Kohli was released, but it wasn't until you know he was fundamentally affected by the uh, more than 40 years in prison that he served. Um, so... That happened just in the past year. That's what happens generally. That political prisoners not released until they're about to die or that they are so medically compromised that their release, well, we're happy, is ultimately, uh, uh, you know, we cannot help but see the impacts of what happened to them. So the question of innocence is not the principal contradiction in the lives of the U.S.'s prisoners of war. Innocence is a moral value that, when taken in the abstract, can fit the needs and interests of those who define them. 
Prisoners of war, such as the Saudi Shakur, were engaged in a struggle to ignite a revolution in the United States that would grant black Americans and the rest of the oppressed the right to determine their own destiny. For this, they were brutally and violently attacked by the full weight of the police state. There has been no peace treaty in the U.S. war on the black liberation movement, and the most recent bipartisan resolution to lynch Assad Shakur is an indication that the war won't end until imperialism is put to rest. So, I mean, think about this. There's a two million bounty on her head, and there's a resolution in Congress that wants to extradite her. The struggle to free political prisoners and prisoners of war is critically important in the larger goal of overthrowing the ruling capitalist oligarchy of U.S. imperialism and replacing it with a socialist system capable of meeting the needs of the masses. Asada Shakur's contribution to this struggle goes far beyond the popular slogan taken from her autobiography. Asada is a former member of the Harlem chapter of the Black Panther Party, and she would go on to leave the BPP and join the Black Liberation Army. The Black Liberation Army conducted guerrilla activities in service of the waning Black Liberation Movement. It was the principal force that freed Asada from prison. Black leaders such as Asada Shakur are feared by the ruling class in its entirety. Asada Shakur's continued suppression speaks to the enduring influence of the black radical tradition on the political class in the United States. In 2013, the FBI increased the bounty on Asada's head from $1 million to $2 million U.S. dollars. Menendez and Rubio's resolution to extradite Asada is no aberration. It is another phase in the ongoing war on U.S. political prisoners and prisoners of war, a war that seeks to smother the flame of socialism and self-determination before it can gather strength in the current period. The case of Asada teaches new left organizers, scholars, and activists many lessons in the struggles to come. First, even though their names are rarely mentioned, the U.S. effort to murder and erase political prisoners such as Asada Shakur and her comrades continues into the present day. This means that the left must not only say her name, but also join organizations that are committed to fighting back against the ongoing effort to destroy and neutralize U.S. political prisoners. Second, Asada's historical trajectory shows the importance of developing solidarity with oppressed nations and people under attack from U.S. imperialism. Asada is not the only black liberation that has been protected by the Cuban people. Robert Williams, Huey P. Newton, and Puerto Rican liberation activist William Morales have also received protection from the socialist nation. William Morales is included in the latest resolution to lynch Asada Shakur. With the U.S. on a path of endless war abroad, the left will need to cultivate relationships with organizations and nations to leverage the political power of the struggle for self-determination and socialism in the United States. Lastly, Asada teaches us that the technologies of the state used to destroy the black liberation movement have expanded to consume the entire infrastructure of the U.S. national security state. U.S. imperialism has the most expansive military apparatus in human history. Every person within the U.S.'s colonial borders is a target of surveillance by the NSA. The NDAA of 2012 gave sitting U.S. presidents the ability to place an individual under indefinite military detention without cause or due process. One in three black men can expect to spend time in the mass incarceration regime in their lifetime. This is not to mention that the concrete war against the black liberation movement has birthed a new program altogether in the form of the FBI's systematic targeting of quote unquote black identity extremists. As the newly organized black identity extremist abolition collective points out, it is difficult to trace the impact of the FBI's black identity extremism program. However, the mysterious deaths of several Ferguson activists appears to indicate that the program is fully operational and represents a serious threat to the lives of black Americans across the country. Thus, the long war in the black liberation movement continues. Both corporate political parties in the United States are loyal soldiers in the war. Menendez and Rubio's coll collaborative effort to lynch Assad and Shakur is a show of force against the socialist nation of Cuba, which has steadfastly defended the human rights of U.S. political prisoners. The resolution is further rooted in the understanding that black leaders such as Assad Shakur and Mumia Abu Jamal present a dangerous alternative to the stagnant and dead-end political and economic conditions of U.S. imperialism. The ruling class will stop at nothing until the memory and lessons of the black liberation movement are fully buried from consciousness. We must remember that the war on the black liberation movement did not end in the 1970s and to stop at nothing to free our political prisoners. So that is the article. I just wanted to show it. You know, I just wanted to read it because I feel like Asada Shakur is not really talked about at all. She trends now because she's become more popular. And I'm so happy that she's more popular. I, I think she should be more popular, right? Uh, I think that she should be read. I think the autobiography on Asada Shakur should be read. I think that... Uh, it's a great thing 
that Asada Shakur is more well known and, and that a lot of people know who she is, especially a lot of black people, a lot of people of color, a lot of oppressed people in the United States now know who Asada Shakur is. But the campaign to allow her to live in the United States, to be with family that remains in the United States, the uh, movement to free political prisoners is not at a strong point right now. And that is really, really unfortunate. I highly recommend everyone go to the Jericho Movement website. So just type in Jericho Movement. Study up on your political prisoners. Support them if you live in any of those areas. Support them. Write letters to them. Uh, do do whatever you can, right, to popularize them, to learn what they contributed, right? I, I think it's so important to do that and to connect them to Julian Assange. So for those of you who may watch this, uh, connect it to the Julian Assange case because there's a lot of people who support Julian Assange who also need to support political prisoners broadly. And I've always, you know, I've done that. Maybe I'll share an article I wrote about Julian Assange in solitary confinement one day to show you just how I've talked about it because I, I think it's so interconnected, right? Mumia Bujamal is a journalist. These liberation uh, movement fighters, they are all in their own right, people who have stood up for the rights, for the freedoms of humanity, right? From imperialism. They, that's what they were doing. That's why they are punished. It's not about cop killing. It's not about any of that. It's not about, the, you know, all these evidence-free accusations or uh, criminal charges that were all the product of a war. You talk to anybody, and I have. I've talked to Juruba bin Wahad. I've, uh, I've talked to uh, many people who fought in that period, who were members of the Black Panther Party. They have always told me that it was a war. What was happening at that time was n just look up 41st and Central 1969, what happened to the Los Angeles chapter of the Black Panther Party, the shootout that lasted more than seven hours with the police. Look at what happened to Fred Hampton. Look what happened to little Bobby Hutton. Look what happened to the Black Panther Party. Look what happened to the Black Liberation Army. Look what happened to the Black Liberation Movement in, as a whole. It was a war, and it's still a war. And that's what I conveyed in this article. It's still a war. It's reported now that black people were stopped at a rate six times higher than white people in 2020 in Los Angeles and San Francisco. This war continues. Jalen Walker, this war continues. This is a war. It's still a war. It's still a war. Look what happens to the 2020 Black Lives Matter uprisings. It's a war. The militarized police responses. Outside of Jalen Walker's funeral, you had military vehicles pulling up. That's war. That is war. The way he was killed, they kill you again, and they continue to kill you. That's <clears throat> that's the function of the police toward oppressed communities, toward black people. That is the function of the police, an occupying force. It's an occupying force. It's a force of war. So Asada Shakur, 75 today. Salute to Asada Shakur, her contributions to socialism, her contributions to the Black Liberation Movement. Our contributions to the class struggle need to be remembered. Read her autobiography. Read all of the things she's written online, her speeches. Study up on Asada Shakur. Study up on her work, especially in a time where there is such a tendency to sanitize, to completely kind of wash over the actual ideas that Asada Shakur was promoting as she was active. She was actively fighting for the freedom and liberation of black people and all people from this exploitative imperialist system. And so study those ideas because, you know, when you study ideas of Asada Shakur, you learn that people like Asada Shakur were learning from revolutionaries, revolutionary theorists, uh, communists, socialists. You learn that there's a historical thread that runs through the lives of all of us, right? That, that we all, all have a duty here. You know, we are all part of a global socialist movement and we need to take that very seriously and be able to continue to point out that threat. So salute to Asada Shakur. Of course, we miss her presence in the United States. Cuba is protecting her. Socialist Cuba is protecting her. And so salute to Cuba for doing 
that enormous duty and honor to the struggle for socialism by doing that. And, and we all have a debt to pay to Cuba. We have a debt to Assad Shakur. And we have a debt to all U.S.-based political prisoners. We have a debt that we have to pay. And uh, it's a long struggle forward in that regard.